What's up guys, this is Jan for Chess24 and I'm going to look at the game between Wei Yi, the Chinese prodigy with the white pieces against an angry world champion against Magnus Carlsen because Magnus Carlsen lost in the first round of the Bilbao Masters to Hikaru Nakamura. This game is played in round number two and no doubt Magnus Carlsen will be looking to come back from that loss as soon as possible. His opponent Wei Yi is the lowest rated player, but what a lowest rated player. He's only 17 years old, already made quite a name for himself in the chess world. We can see he's rated 2696, dropped off a little recently, and the world champion, and of course world number one at 2855. The 0505 doesn't mean this game ended in a draw, even though it might, who knows. It, but it does mean that their previous encounter ended in a draw and their head-to-head -head score is therefore half to half. Let's get right into it, where he starts with 1d4 and Carlsen shows from the get-go that he wants to play for, his, for a win, goes for the move 1g6. And if a top player chooses the flank openings like g6, it normally means I want to keep the pieces on the board, I don't want a theory battle where maybe in some long theoretical line the position simplifies. Let's play as complicated a game as we can. Carlsen managed that himself that if you want to play for a win with black against 1d4, the flank openings is really all you have. And it hasn't always worked out for him. He's lost a game to Arkady Nadic in Baden-Baden, for example. But today he is clearly in a fighting mood. Where Yi occupies the center, goes e4, bishop g7, and then decides to not play with c4, but to play knight to c3. Carlsen goes d6. Note that he does not hurry to put his knight on f6, also after white's next move, bishop e3. With knight f6, black could take the game into territory of what I believe we call the Pierce defense. But instead Carlsen sticks in very modern flank opening territory, goes a6, keeping this knight still on g8 and prepares to gain space on the queen side with b5 ASAP. White has many options here, where Yi goes for arguably the most principled one, grabbing as much space in the center as you can, plays f4, and within the realms of this non-theoretical line, this stuff is actually pretty theoretical. Black intends to go bishop to b7 and then c5, break up the white center, while white tries to expand as quickly as he can in the center and make it hard for black to develop his pieces. Therefore, the next move, e5, is also well established and it makes black answer with bishop to b7, occupying this long diagonal. This bishop is very strong, so the white plan is bishop to d3 and surprisingly, in many, many lines, bishop to e4, exchange a bishop immediately. This is, as mentioned, a very established theoretical position. Carlsen goes for the sharpest move and here and also over the next couple moves he's gonna show us that even though he plays a flank opening which arguably is meant to take the game out of theory, he's still done his homework in this particular line and it's not like he's just winging it but he's actually studied the line in quite some detail. He goes for the sharpest move c5 where he plays bishop e4 as mentioned to neutralize this bishop and also to force black to put his knight on a better square, because on e4 the knight targets d6 and c5, asking black what he intends, intends to do next. d takes e5 is always a strategic mistake here, white goes d takes e, this is a target and these pieces are very much dormant, so not a great idea. It's also not a great idea, and that's maybe less obvious, to go c takes d4, because after bishop d takes d4, white's lead in development is too powerful, after let's say d, e, f, e, black still lacks development, and if he tries to <clears throat> right that wrong by going knight h6, white is in time to strike with e6, putting black's position in major disarray. Therefore, Carlsen plays the theoretically acclaimed and better move. He does not worry about his hanging pawns, but decides to develop this knight with knight h6 as soon as possible. White has some options here. I myself played the not very impressive move c3 in a tournament game a long, long time ago, went on to lose that game and had a look afterwards when I decided that the sharper move d takes c5 should favor white. However, that is a bit dated, that knowledge. My thoughts then were that knight f5 you can meet with queen e2, followed by a very sh quick long castles, and the white initiative looked very dangerous to me. Similarly, the move knight g4, which was popular at the time, can be met with queen e2 or queen d2. Once again, I didn't manage to equalize with black. But Carlsen goes to show here that he has done his homework and he plays the move d takes e5, which has rarely been played in this position. 
because people were afraid of letting the C pawn <clears throat> advance, forcing an endgame where the C pawn will remain on the board, and this looked very dangerous for Black. But Carlsen has a different opinion. He goes knight f6. This move is pretty much forced. Queen takes d8, rook takes d8, knight takes f6, e takes f6. So far, so good. And now the big question is gonna be is this pawn a weakness or an asset? Or neither? Why is the choice here? To my mind and to my computer's mind, more importantly, the most challenging move is the move a4, trying to include this rook into the game and support his c pawn. I've done a bit of clicking and I believe that black should manage to hold on here, but it's by no means easy or obvious. For example, rook c8 takes takes. After rook a6, black seems to be in time to go knight f5, then knight to e7 against bishop c5 with roughly an equal position. And I also tried, what, what did I try? Bishop c5 immediately here. When once again, it looks like black was surviving. Rook takes c6, b4, maybe rook back to c8, but it wouldn't necessarily be pleasant. And I have a feeling this might have been an, a more critical test of Carlsen's opening choice. Where he plays more directly, he goes c7, pushes this pawn, forces rook c8. And of course you have to defend your main asset by going bishop b6. This f4 pawn is not really that important. Black also doesn't really have time to take it because after ef, y would go long castles, playing rook e1 and meet castles with a very simple plan. Rook d d8, intending rook d1, rook takes c8, the other rook to d8 and queen the c pawn. No time for such adventures. Instead, Carlsen very quickly, showing that he still knew what he was doing here, plays the move king d7, playing to bring the king to c6 to challenge this bishop and also, if needed, to hide it on b7, reinforcing the c8 rook, should there ever be a scenario where multiple white rooks make it to the d8 square. Where you played bishop a5 might look a bit strange, but in reality it transposes to what normal play would lead us to with long castles, king c6, the bishop has to move anyway, and here knight f5 would be the best move as well. We get to this position in the game with a different move order. Bishop a5, knight f5, long castles, king to c6. The black plan is not so much to go e takes f4, but to go knight d6 and knight c4 or knight b7, challenge this bishop and then pick up his main foe, the pawn on c7. Why does the thing what to do about it? He has many options here. The most direct to me seem to be to take and go rook e1, target the e5 pawn, when it's not completely clear if black has time for f6, because now white goes rook d8. And there were some pretty lines here, for example, knight d6, intending knight to c4. White stops that with b3, the knight goes the other way, knight b7, and it looks like black achieved his aim, targeting the rook on d8 and the bishop, if the bishop moves, black wins material. But white has a very strong tactic here. Knight d4 check, e takes d4, rook e6 check, king c5 forced, b4 check, king c4, rook c6 check, and it would be mate next move. This line is not necessarily relevant theoretically. After b3 instead of knight b7, black has a stronger move, bishop f8, weird move, trying to bring the bishop to e7, where it reinforces the d6 knight and challenges the white rook on d8. It looks like the position is still roughly equal, but there was certainly a possibility. Another one was to not take on e5, but go rook he1 immediately when black had to find the move bishop to h6, which pins the f4 pawn, thereby stops this threat, because e takes f4 is not very good. Knight d4 check, and this powerful knight, once it disappears, white has the good old plan of putting all kinds of rooks on the 7th or 8th rank with troubles for black. King b7, knight takes f5, by the way, would not really help that, because even if you love f pawns, 4 are too too many. In the game, however, none of this occurred, where Yi went for the move rook to d8. Carlson stated later yeah, that he thought this opening line was quite okay and that around move 20, this is move 19, he had the feeling that black could start playing for a win. He went for knight d6 once again, the same old idea as knight c4 or knight b7, where Yi now takes, takes and goes rook to d1, attacking the knight and forcing black to play the move he wanted to play anyway, though knight to c4 targeting this bishop. Here probably Wei Yi understood that it's not realistic to try to queen that c7 pawn, for example rook takes h8, 
It's very well met with bishop takes h8, rook d8, and king b7. When this pawn is not gonna stay with us for much longer, and white is just in real big trouble. And therefore, Wei Yi tried to at least exchange this pawn for the e5 pawn, simplifying the game, leading to an equal position. Or, well, that's probably what he had planned to. Carlson does grab the pawn. The computer does not agree with that decision. The computer wants to move b4, distracting the bishop from targeting the e5 pawn. And after bishop takes b4, e4, another strong sufficient suit, knight d4 check, king takes c7. The computer prefers black. Material is equal, but this e pawn is quite strong. So that was an interesting option. But even the world champion is human, and if you can finally get rid of an opponent pass pawn on the seventh rank, you do it. Rook takes c7. Now we, we see where Yi's idea. He wants to play b3 to distract this knight from defending the e5 pawn. And it's not so obvious how Carlsen should react. Maybe it is obvious. He goes knight to e3, not giving up the pawn without a fight, targeting the d1 rook, and also just in case the pawn on g2. Here it looks like white is in trouble, but Wei Yi shows his tremendous calculating ability, plays the strongest move. If he plays, let's say, a straightforward move like rook 1d6 check, king b7, rook takes h8, bishop takes h8, it turns out that his position has become untenable because this bishop is under attack and after bishop e5, black just picks up all kinds of things along the second rank with the winning position after bishop e5. So you can't do that. Instead, you had to do quite some calculating. And if the 17-year-old prodigy can do something well, it is calculating lines and he shows his ability here. Starts with the move bishop e5, leaves his rook on d1 on priest, if black ignores it and exchanges everything, then the position becomes quite equal indeed because here white can just defend everything along the second rank with rook d2 and a draw would not be far away. Not what Carlsen had in mind, therefore Carlsen after bishop e5 plays a more challenging, knight takes d1 and here we see the amount of lines the way he had to calculate. Because it's not a good idea to recapture the exchange with bishop c7, then it turns out that after Either knight e3 or knight c3, both are strong. The black, the white forces are, I don't know, overextended, whatever you want to call it. c7 and g2 are under attack, and white can't keep both. And such an endgame would be very close to hopeless because of the two hanging pieces. But Wei Yi had anticipated all this and had seen that he doesn't have to be in a hurry to reclaim that exchange instantly, goes rook d6 check, king, king b7, bishop takes g7, rook to g8, still an exchange down because his bishop is hanging, the bishop goes all the way back to d4, now this knight, if it wants to stay in the game, has only one move, knight to c3. Remember that way he had to calculate all this way back when he went for this line. Rook b6 check, king to c8, the only good square for the king, because you don't want to drop the a-pawn with check, and bishop e5, and it turns out that black cannot hold on to the extra exchange if this rook moves. Ah, okay, admittedly not the best square. Then rook b8 check picks up, at the very least, the rook on g8. Still, the adventures are far from over Carlsen. Still not happy with a draw, which could have been attained, for example, by knight a2, king b2, knight b4, when black is temporarily a pawn up, but after rook f6, followed by knight g5 or knight e5, why would get his pawn back and one could shake hands not Carlsen's idea, instead he plays the move rook to d8. Threatening in many a line rook d1 check, intending to checkmate the king on b2, for example, bishop c7, king c7, let's say rook takes a6, rook d1 check, king b2, b4, and the threat of rook b1 checkmate can only be parried with significant material losses. So Wei Yi, still not impressed, once again, plays the best move, king to b2, when black is not in time for any of these rook d1 shenanigans. If he went knight d1 check, the white king would just return. Black still doesn't have a defense or a way to keep his extra exchange. If this rook goes somewhere, once again, white wins material by picking up this knight. Therefore, Carlsen had to dig deep to keep the game going, and he finds a way. He goes knight to d5, bishop takes c7, finally. White wins his exchange back, king takes c7, and rook takes a6, 
Now, why does even a pawn up? So why did Carlsen enter this? The reason is that he has spotted that this rook on the sixth rank looks quite active, but does not have a lot of squares after king b7. Actually, none of the squares on the sixth rank are available. If it goes to a5, it just continues to get questioned with king b6. Therefore, this rook has to end up on the very passive a3 square. And that's where it went in the game. Once again, black could dream of mating constructions with b4, knight c3, rook d1, but he has to be precise trying to implement them. If he starts with b4, white just goes rook a4 and the knight can't really move because b4 would always drop. Set cast plays a stronger move, plays knight to e3, tending to maybe take this pawn, but mainly to once again work on this construction. Knight d1, knight c3, then b4, and checkmate the white king. Where Yi understands there's a serious threat, for example, g3 is met with knight d1, king c1, knight c3. The <coughs> trap is almost closing. And if, ah, one more line, knight d2 runs into rook takes d2, followed by knight b1 check. Cute little tactic. While if white tries to create some space for his king, he only gets this far. And checkmate. So, white has to do something, doesn't have time to keep the g pawn and where he finds the best defense once again goes for the move c4 providing his king with much needed space black doesn't have a choice has to take this pawn b takes c4 and this is maybe the first time that way he commits a serious mistake in this game he does not play the move b4 which would have been strongest targeting this knight making some space for his rook and his king and preparing the push of his two passed pawns Position will remain very complicated, but probably within the realms of equality. For example, after knight takes g2, rook c3, targeting this guy, preparing a4, maybe knight e5. White seems to be alright. Similar story after knight d5, rook a5. The position is complicated, but doesn't seem like black is better. Instead, way he goes for knight to e5 immediately. Logical move, activating his knight, but also allowing black to activate his rook. Rook d2 check, king to c3. Here Carlsen has a decision, he could just go for rook takes g2, the greedy move, when after b takes c4, or knight takes f7, both possible. The game would probably become a race between the white queenside forces and the black past f-pawn after f6, outcome unclear. Or black could bank his hopes on his c-pawn, and that's what he does, and that is a much stronger approach. Rook c2 check, king d4, king b4, knight d5 is a similar story. King d4, knight f5, king d5, and c3. And all of a sudden, this pawn is very, very far advanced. And objectively, this position seems to be winning for black. Still, Wei Yi had some ideas up his sleeve. He starts with king c5, where it looks like black can just win by removing this rook. Let's say, let's say rook takes g2, intending to queen his pawn. However, white goes knight to c6, c2, rook a7 check, king to c8. This pawn can't be stopped, but white has his own play, goes king b6, c1 queen, and rook c7 checkmate. So things weren't that easy yet, and therefore the world champion had to come up with a pretty strong defensive move. He finds the best move here, and a spectacular one at that, the move knight to d6. Leaving the knight on priest, but the idea is to just win a tempo. After king d6, rook d2 comes with a check, king c5, c2, and now the white play arrives a move too late because this would be a very unpleasant check to face. Therefore, Wei Yi continues with his main plan after knight d6, which is to go knight c6 and threatens rook a7 check, but now Carlsen has time to parry that play. He does so with a natural move once again, knight e4 check. Turns out this wasn't the strongest. The strongest move was king to c7, humble move, defending this knight and preparing to meet rook a7 with knight b7 when black can't, white can't really keep everything controlled if king b5, which keeps defending this knight. Now black is in time to go rook takes g2 and the threat of c2, c1 should win the game for black. Instead, knight e4 check was played, king to b5, still insisting on this counterplay. Carlsen now wanted to bring his king, king c7, intending to go to d6. But since after rook a7 check, he does not have this Gegenschach, as we say in German, things are still not easy. King d6, and where he keeps fighting, goes rook a4, 
attacking this knight and also planning to put the rook on c4 to keep an eye on the c2 pawn. f5, obvious move, reinforcing the knight in the center of the board. King to b6, another strong little move because the idea is to go rook d4 check, forcing this king away from the a-pawn and then the a-pawn wants to run. Here there were some ways for black to win, none of them very obvious. Carlson plays a strong and good move, rook takes g2. Another move that was good was rook d2, stopping white from going rook d4 check, because after rook d4, just king e6, now c2 is a serious threat once again. But rook takes g2 is good, creating a passed f-pawn just for rainy days. Rook d4 check, king e6, a4, where he organizes his own play, the a-pawn starts running. And here Carlson had a win, but it's by no means easy to find. I still don't fully understand the mechanism, but I'll show you how it goes. You go rook b2, attacking this pawn. The most obvious reply is b4, and now you go rook d2, now that you lured the pawn to b4. And the point is that after, let's say, a5, black goes c2, white is forced to go rook c4, dealing with his pawn. Now there's king to d5, and since the pawn is on b4, no longer on b3, this rook is under attack and can't be defended and black is winning. Can't be kept on the c-file either, I should say. So this seemed to be a winning continuation. There's some other tries, but nothing works for white. However, rook b2 to force this pawn forward is quite a tough move to make. Carlsen made another slightly cryptic move. He played rook a2, provoking the a-pawn to advance, which of course Wei Yi gladly did with a5, and now he went rook b2. I'm not sure what his idea was. Maybe in one of these lines after b4, he was hoping that he could attack a rook on c4 without allowing knight a5. I think I forgot to mention that in this position after knight to a5, the rook stays defended, but <clears throat> black can just go f4, f3, f2, f1. So maybe it was Carlson's intention to eliminate that possibility, but the problem is this pawn has advanced for a very valuable move and in many lines this counterplay will prove sufficient. For example, let's say b4 here and we try the same thing we just tried with rook d2. Now white goes a6, black has one idea which would be knight to d6 stopping mm -hmm. rook to c4. That would work pretty well if the white pawn was still on a5, but in this position white has a7 and his own play will probably guarantee him a drop. This line continues with knight c8 check, but let's just call it equal. And Carlson himself admitted after the game that had Wei Yi played b4, he would probably just have repeated moves with c2, rook c4, king d5, targeting this rook, rook d4 check, king e6, rook c4, king d5, and a draw. Wei Yi saw that this probably led to a draw, but he thought he spotted an even better possibility posing some problems for the world champion, he went for the move king c7. The very first side, this blunders the b3 pawn, but this b3 pawn cannot and should not be touched, because now we see where his idea is to go rook takes e4, vacating the d4 square, f takes e, knight d4 check, king anywhere, knight takes b3, and white is a piece up, controls the c1 square, and can therefore go about his business of queening his a pawn. But he is facing the world champion, and the world champion cannot be fooled like that and Magnus found an absolutely amazing resource here which once again is by no means obvious but whatever works works. He found the move knight to c5 planning to go c2, knight takes b3 and c1. Of course Wei Yi is not gonna allow that to happen without a fight but there is no good defense. If you go b4, c2, rook c4, knight b3 will not be fast enough because white has a6 once again with counterplay but instead, he has knight a6 check. Very, very nasty little move. And after king b6, let's say, there's knight takes b4, knight takes b4, rook takes b4, distracting this rook from a c-file, rook takes b4, c1, queen, and black wins. But you must have realized that with horror, inst instead he tried another obvious move, rook to c4 immediately, attacking the knight and the pawn. But once again, Carlsen has a study-like win at his disposal, and he does find it. He goes knight a6 check, king b6, rook takes b3 check, giving up this knight, king takes a6, and we see an idea we've seen earlier now in its full glory, king to d5, and this rook cannot be kept on c4 or defended. There's no knight a5, 
the white position all of a sudden becomes hopeless because the c pawn is still alive and after rook b4 or really most other rook moves black just goes c2 and this pawn becomes a queen that's what happened in the game where he tried to resist with his rook and knight for a while but the black pieces are too well coordinated here or the white piece is too poorly coordinated depending which side of the board you're sitting at and therefore the game ended pretty quickly here series of forceful moves rook Queen c4 check, king b7, queen e4 check, forcing knight c6, queen d5, very clever little move because it stops white from going a6, since a6 is now made with queen d7, picking up the rook. Therefore white can't really do anything where he tried king c7, but queen d6 check, king b7, queen d7 check, king b8, and now we have the same status quo that the a-pawn can't advance, white can't really move anything, and Carlsen has a free hand to just push his own pass pawn with f4. There's absolutely nothing left to be done for white. For example, knight e5 is pretty well met with queen e8 check, picking up the knight. And therefore, Wei Yi resigned here. Tough fight, tough technical game where I think both sides play very well. Magnus Carlsen demonstrated some very nice opening knowledge by going for this d takes e5 in a sideline, but he showed that he knows his way around in such things as well. Then, yeah, Wei Yi probably. I'm not quite sure how to do it, but missed a stronger continuation somewhere around here, either rook e1 or f takes e, followed by rook e1. Carlsen started playing for a win, where he showed his amazing calculating ability by finding this sequence here, starting with bishop takes e5, giving up an exchange or for quite a couple of moves, but finally reclaiming it. Defended very well, then went astray in the position after c4, b takes e4 with knight e5. After which the black C pawn became too strong. Carlsen then missed a win or two, starting with maybe king c7, intending knight b7 check. Later, instead of rook takes g2, there was also rook d2. And after a4, there was the very complicated win with rook b2. So not a flawless game later on in the technical stage from the world champion. But when he got one more chance after rook b2, king c7, he found this amazing knight c5 and brought the full point home. So the world champion is back on 50%, back in the race for tournament victory. He's going to be pleased with that one. His, one of his potential successors, where he showed that he can play and calculate at the highest level. But in the end, he had to pay the price for being too ambitious against the world champion and lost the game. I hope you enjoyed the video. There's still a lot of play in Bilbao left. I'll be doing live commentary most of these days if you're watching this video on whatever day it is. 15th of July 2016. If you don't, I hope you enjoyed it anyway. See you guys around soon.